Number five, or fish. Coming in at the number five spot is this terrifying 16 foot long monstrosity hauled out of the ocean by Chilean fishermen. Shocking those who learned, like me, that fish can be five meters long sometimes. The clip was posted to TikTok where it went viral almost immediately, sweeping up 10 million views pretty quickly. Most people worried this fish might be a bringer of bad times, and there might be an inkling of truth to that. This fish, called an oar fish, is thought in some cultures to be an omen of impending bad fortune. I mean, I understand it completely. If, if I picked this thing out of the water, I would not think that I had been blessed by good fortune. In Japanese folklore, this fish is sometimes referred to as Ryogo no Tsukai, translating to the messenger from the sea god's palace, and I'm sure I butchered that pronunciation. I'm so very sorry. It's linked to the legend of Namazu, a giant sea snake which caused earthquakes whenever it would rise. Or fish live deep, deep, deep in the depths of the sea. And some scientists theorize that they only ever rise nearer to surface level whenever there's a disturbance in the tectonic plates, which would definitely make this fish a bad omen and a bringer of earthquakes. Now the actual oar fish, once you get aside all the legend, terrifying as it might look, is a bit of a gentle giant. It's the largest bony fish in the world, and it isn't much of a predator, preferring to swim around just hoovering up plankton. They barely even have teeth, to be honest, and they don't really pose a threat to humans. Unless you consider scaring the heck out of you a threat. You want to watch more scary sea creature videos? Well, I got great news for you because we have loads upon loads on the channel. Number four, green-eyed shark. Now, if the ocean is where all the scariest stuff in the world is hiding, that goes triple for any body of water around Australia, which is home to some of the actual most terrifying entities ever to walk the planet and swim the planet and fly the planet. It's where they send the animals that are too hardcore for the rest of the world. An Australian angler, Trapman Bermagee, pulled out this disgusting wretch of a fish some 2,000 feet beneath the sea. He captioned it, the face of a deep sea rough skinned shark. Now, a little bit of a fake Australian accent there, I, I can't help it. Unsurprisingly, most commenters wanted to point out how disgusting the thing was, which is very similar to what I'm doing now. Now, usually I'm a sucker for green eyes, but not on this leathery little monster. This thing looks like a baseball glove that came to life. I, I'm not having it. There's actually a lot of debate as to what this little thing is. Some commenters had suggested that it was a cookie cutter shark, which might sound adorable when you hear that. That sounds pretty cute, but I promise you it is not cute at all. A cookie cutter shark is named that because of its jagged mouth, which leaves cookie cutter like imprints on its victims, just like big holes in anything that it's biting at. However, the fisherman pointed out this wasn't a cookie cutter shark. A cookie cutter shark looks absolutely vile, but in a very different way. A cookie cutter shark looks more like a mole rat that was left in the sun for a few weeks, whereas this thing looks like it was grilled before ever being born. Now, another commenter suggested that this shark could be something called an Endeavor Spur Dog Shark, which is a mouthful and a half. Now, whatever the creature is, it goes without saying, I want very little to do with this shark. Number three, long-nosed chimera. You wouldn't really expect anything horrifying to exist in Newfoundland. It's a very pleasant place. You think it's mostly just chips and jigs dinner all the way down. Well, for Gary Goodyear, a fisherman out of Templeman, Newfoundland, he pulled this long-nosed chimera out of the water and gave himself quite the shock. His nets went some 2,000 feet down into the water where he unearthed this long beaked mystery fish. When he pulled it up, the crew could not believe what they had seen. It was not at all what they were expecting. I have to include this quote from one of the articles because it's just, it's too newfy not to include. Goodyear said, We're hauling away and by and by I seen this coming around the roller. I said, good God, what in the heck is that? Now when he first pulled it up, he wondered at first if it might have been a platypus because of the impressive snoot on the beast. He described this pelagic nightmare's beak as being very rubbery, like cartilage. No one on the boat had any idea what they had found, so they kept the body of the fish and took it to a local fishery in the hopes that someone could properly ID their mystery monster. Luckily, somebody actually knew and it got correctly identified as a long-nosed chimera an ancient deep sea dwelling fish famous for its green eyes and putting this gently, its monstrous appearance. The reason that its nose felt like cartilage is because the fish is completely cartilage from nose to tail. It's actually boneless. So this fish is a spineless coward. The creature most likely perished as it was being pulled up. An extreme pressure change from being 2,000 feet beneath the sea gave it a serious case of the bends. Maybe was a blessing in disguise because I'm not sure I'd want to see this thing alive. I'm not sure I'd want to see it thrashing around on the floor of a commercial fishing boat. I think that wouldn't be good for anybody. Number two, decorator crab. 
Our next spot comes to us all the way from Thailand. Some local fishermen in Koh Yao Noi pulled up their nets while fishing for crabs and discovered they'd brought up an alien looking creature with them that mystified them. They couldn't identify this thing. Take a look at this creepy little crawly. Kind of looks like a spider that's got a good fashion sense, got really into accessorizing. But it almost kind of looks like it shouldn't be moving at all. Like it's just some garbage that got cursed into being alive or maybe some seaweed that developed sentience. The fishermen were understandably pretty puzzled by this thing. So they decided to post a video of the then unidentified critter hoping to get some answers and for once the internet was actually helpful. The creature was correctly identified as a decorator crab, which is not something I'd heard of before this video, but I am so glad I learned about it and I am even happier that I can pass it on to you. A decorator crab gets its name for its habit of using whatever it can scavenge around its environment to make into camouflage from predators. Now the really cool thing is that they'll use literally anything they can find. Debris, garbage, they'll even use little bits of other animals in a gruesome manner like fins or parts of a crab shell. If it can be attached to it in some way, a decorator crab will stick it to itself. They're covered in tiny velcro like hairs that allow them to attach their findings easily. I, I would love having that, it would save me so much time getting dressed. They've been recorded chewing on things like kelp or seaweed to break them down into more easily attachable accessories. Now most of the creatures on this list have been weird and scary and kind of look horrifying and I'm not gonna lie, the decorator crab kind of looks pretty scary too, but I absolutely adore the decorator crab. It is showing up every other creature in the ocean when it comes to outfits. I love the garbage costume. It's given camp in a very good way. This thing is like a crab lady gaga and I love it. Number one, ghost shark. Roman Fedortsov routinely entertains his 600,000 Instagram followers with pictures of all the strange creatures he fishes up while sailing around Murmansk, a port city in Russia. His Instagram is a treasure trove of scary undersea finds, and I absolutely recommend that you toss him a follow if you're into this sort of thing, as he's kind of the head honcho for it. This video could easily just have been five things that he fished out himself. He, like, nobody is pulling out weird things the way Roman is. But with so many to choose from, I had a tough time, but I landed on this here fish, sometimes called Frankenstein's fish. Due to the stitches all over its body looking like it's been sewn together from the bodies of several other fishes. It's also been referred to as a rat fish, a ghost shark, a spook fish, but officially they're known as ghost chimeras. I like that it's got nothing but scary nicknames. These things are bad news from teeth to tail. They have a spiny dorsal fin that's poisonous to the touch. It's got a mouth of rat-like teeth that helps it grind down anything it catches, crushing its prey in its jaws. Usually goes after things like crabs or prawns, so the rat teeth help pulverize the shells. These little things also have an inherent ability to detect the electric fields produced by other creatures, and I wish I knew even the littlest bit about biology because this fish sounds like it's magic. Fish also sounds overpowered, not gonna lie. Now I think it's a little treat. We ought to have a little slideshow at the end of just a bunch of Fedortsov's weirdest catches and I'll just react to them. Ready? Okay, here we go, lightning round. Who would make this? Why would a creature evolve like this? I guarantee you this thing looks cuter as sashimi. That, that is a face not even Mother Nature could love, if that even is a face. You know what, this one, I'm actually kind of coming around to. I wouldn't touch it, I wouldn't order it, but I kind of like it. Number five, Dagon and the Deep Ones. Coming up first on our list is a multifaceted entry with Dagon and the Deep Ones who worship him. They kind of go together. What is a Deep One? It's not a sea monster that went to first year philosophy and is always trying to wax poetic, but rather a Deep One refers to a race of amphibious, humanoid-like-ish sea creatures closely resembling creatures like frogs or axolotls. If you've ever seen Hellboy's Abe Sapien or the monster from Shape of Water, those monsters are actually a pretty good representation for what a Deep One should look like. Deep Ones get their name from their homes, deep, deep beneath the sea, obviously, where they live out their cold, often miserable lives. When Deep Ones do venture to the surface, they do so to sweep humans under their influence, promising them riches in exchange for warship, sometimes even mating with them, creating disgusting hybrid Deep Ones. And first and foremost, to ingratiate them into the cult of Dagon, worshiping their master, Dagon, a massive, massive Deep One of fantastic power. Dagon appears in the short story appropriately named Dagon, which is also a great jumping on point. If you've ever been curious about reading H.P. Lovecraft and you didn't know where to start, 
It's one of the first appearances of any of the Lovecraft monsters at all. Dagon is worshipped by humans and deep ones in equal measure, no doubt thanks to his influence. Dagon is immortal, massive, and commands a lot of respect. It's unknown what the full extent of Dagon's power is, but given that he's an immortal sea monster with dominion over a race of pelagic nightmares that do his every bidding, let's assume that if he really wanted to stir up trouble, it would not be that difficult for him. Just ask the town of Innsmouth how they feel about their master. They've got nothing but positive things to say, I'm sure. And hey, while I got you here, if you're liking what we do, We'd always appreciate a subscribe our way, and you'll catch the best horror videos in your inbox every single day. Number four, the Shogoths. A Shogoth, or a Shogoth, I'm really not sure, which does sound a bit like something a 1920s chimney sweep might yell at you to get off. Hey, Shogoth is a disgusting, writhing mess of iridescent black slime and a sea of eyeballs engineered by the Elder Things to function as a race of tools for their will, as they're mostly used for undersea construction. They're amorphous, shape-shifting monstrosities, able to mock and reflect all matter of organ and life. A Shoggoth is capable of molding itself however it needs to see fit to accomplish its dark dealings, which make them the perfect tools for the Elder Things. Now, The first generation of Shoggoths were brainless husks, solely driven to appease their masters. But over the eons of their existence, the Shoggoths began to mutate and develop a low form of consciousness, eventually rising up and overthrowing the Elder Things altogether and working for themselves to build their own cities, where they now reside in their city in Antarctica, poorly imitating their old masters, shrieking, Tikali, Tikali, over and over, an old rallying cry the Elder Things would shout at the Shoggoths to get them to work. Poor, poor little amorphous shape-shifting monstrosities. Now, although a Shoggoth was intended to serve mostly as a being for construction, they're not without their abilities. A Shoggoth is hulkingly strong, capable of crushing a human in seconds, and they're known for using their brute strength to solve problems in their way. For example, the Shoggoth that makes an appearance in the Mountains of Madness crushes an entire rookery of penguins that was in its way beneath its mighty weight. While the Shoggoths don't seem to have any higher goals or aspirations, they've shown themselves to be threatening enough that if crossed, you'll regret ever dismissing them as nothing more than tools. Number three, Yugonalak. Yugonalak is colloquially known as the Defiler and is more properly known as the god of depravity and perversion, which is just about the worst way you can introduce yourself on a first date. Yugonalak isn't just into human perversions. Oh, no, no, no. This wretched great one has its sights set on something much bigger than anything our little human brains could conjure up. Yugalanak is after depravity on an incomprehensible scale. That's a word that gets thrown around a lot in the Lovecraft mythos, incomprehensible. Yugalanak's true form is unknown, as it seems to exist in a state outside of a physical body. But when it's looking to pursue some of its disgusting pleasures, it always acquires a human host. And when it takes a human host, it warps its body into a wretched, grotesquely obese form, lacking a head or a neck, and featuring a mouth in the palm of both hands. And I cannot imagine that it is getting up to anything good with those palms. Yugawanak is unlike most other great ones in that it's capable of directly speaking to humans in plain old English instead of indecipherable guttural noises. Its ability to speak English and communicate is what helps it to pursue its dark goals as it seeks out humans who read perverse and forbidden literature and it doesn't just hunt Fifty Shades of Grey fans. It plants seeds of interest in human minds to research and eventually manipulating curious enough humans to read from the Revelation of Glocky, a cursed book containing Yugalanak's name. When read, it will be summoned. When Yugalanak is summoned, it makes its guests an offer, offering to make the summoner into a priest of Yugalanak, welcoming them into its service. It's best to accept this gracious offer, as a rejection will offend Yugalanak deeply, leading to the summoner to become its next meal. Unfortunate for you, but either way, Yugalanak is very pleased with the outcome. Either it gets a new servant for its life, or it gets a nice little midday snack. Number two, Nyarlotep. Now, Nyarlotep is one of the most sinister entities in all of the Lovecraft pantheon, and one of the most popular beings as well, appearing across several stories in the universe, both by Lovecraft and other authors over the years. Nyarlotep first appears in the short story, Nyarlotep, which is also another great jumping on point for new Lovecraft fans who want to get into the lore somewhere and don't know where to start. It's pretty self-contained. Nyarlotep is unique in the Pantheon for several reasons, but first and foremost is its freedom. Nyarlotep isn't trapped under the sea or in the stars like Cthulhu or Azathoth, but rather enjoys the freedom of the earth as it wanders. It usually likes taking the form of a man, wandering as a tall, joyous, friendly man, 
all the better for it to influence people with. It's said that Nyarlathotep has thousands upon thousands of forms and manifestations, and we can probably safely assume that most of them are horrifying and sanity destroying. Nyarlathotep could actually be described as the most human-like of any of the Elder Gods, which makes it all the more threatening. It's able to sway humans easily, gathering cults of personality around it. The original short story in which it appears, Nyarlathotep is gaining influence over the populations by wandering the world, performing incredible miracles, claiming to have lived for 27 centuries, winning over the hearts and minds of legions of followers willing to devote themselves completely for Nyarlathotep's will. Now, Nyarlathotep seems to take a sickening pleasure in driving humans to madness. For Nyarlathotep, death isn't the end game, but manipulating and twisting humans, driving them to insanity, that's the thrill. I guess it gets pretty boring being an unending, uh, unstoppable power beyond the stars. You gotta find something to keep the day exciting, right? Merely being around Nyarlathotep is enough to make a man sick. Nyarlathotep isn't the absolute most powerful entity in the mythos, but it is definitely one of the most nefarious and threatening. Number one, Yog Sothoth. Oh, it, it doesn't even feel good saying that coming out of the throat. I, I shouldn't be talking about stuff like this. This is, this is above my pay grade. Yog Sothoth is a horrifying, unfathomably powerful god, and one of the most powerful gods in the whole mythos. If there's one big takeaway from H.P. Lovecraft's mythos, it's that there's always bigger fish up the food chain. We are so insignificant compared to everything else in the cosmos, but we think ourselves so important. We, the beastly fools of mankind, are dwarfed by the radiant greatness of Cthulhu, but Cthulhu himself is dwarfed by creatures like yogg Sophoth. yogg Sophoth, or Yogi, as his close friends like to call him, is the embodiment of all time and space across the multiverse. yogg Sophoth, like most gods in the Lovecraft pantheon, is an indescribable horror beyond human comprehension, and like Nyarlathotep, is known to be able to manifest and take several avatars to better serve its needs. But its most common form is described as that of being a massive, fractally glowing green orbs that continuously merge, separate, and regrow in an unending, spiraling sea of tentacles, tendrils, and eyes. Yaxothoth sees all. As the manifestation of time and space across the multiverse, there is nothing that can escape its gaze. It's wise to the entirety of all knowledge. It tempts humans by offering to impart that knowledge to those foolish enough to try and take advantage of that offer, who then have their lives utterly destroyed by madness after seeking its favor. The mere sight of Yaxothoth in its natural form is enough to destroy the human brain irreparably. Now yogg Sothoth's goals are just utterly beyond our understanding. It can't even be truly said that yogg Sothoth is evil in the manner we understand. Our ideas of morality and good and evil just wouldn't register to a being like this. We're just too small to even begin to comprehend the horrors of the multiverse. And it's best we don't, because the more you try to study something like this, the more your obsession grows and the more you seal your own fate. Number five, the Lernean Hydra. I'm no Hercules per se. Yeah, nothing. But thankfully, actually, because those are pretty big shoes to fill. Because that dude had to be brave beyond just like deep breaths and good pep talks. Guy had to literally fight like a 10-story condo building. How does one dude equipped with a club and a sword kill a 10-story building with teeth and three heads? Well, five heads. Well, 10 heads. Depending on how many you cut off, I guess. I guess that's why his name will be remembered and mine will be lost at sea. I guess he was a demigod, half powerful, half regular. A little unfair. By the way, which Hercules did you grow up on? I grew up on the Disney version and Kevin Sorbo. Ugh, oh, what a hunk. But there's been a lot, including the ancient real guy. She's known as simply the Hydra. As a serpentine water monster in Greek and Roman mythology, it's terrifying. Its lair was at the Lake of Lerna, also known to be the entrance of the underworld. Yikes. In the myth, the monster is killed by Heracles, Hercules, as the second of his 12 labors. Okay, so this guy did it and then went on to go and do like 10 more. 10 and 0. Like, how hard can it be, right? I mean, it does have multiple heads. Yeah, it does have that. Also, apparently has poisonous breath and blood so violent that uh, its scent is even deadly. Later versions of the Hydra story added regeneration to the monster's abilities too, so it can just start growing heads back at will. For every head chopped off, the Hydra will regrow two heads. So every time the Meg bites a head, there's two more. Another two are growing, yeah. Good thing this thing was hungry and swallows whales whole because uh, that's gonna be a lot of protein. Number four, Jormungandr. Keeping it in the mythology department, we head up a little north. Jormungandr, AKA huge monster. Also known as the Midgard Serpent or 
the world serpent. It is a sea serpent and the middle child of Loki and giantess Angraboda. And those middle children, huh? Always the problem, kids. I would know. I am one. According to the prose Edda, Odin took Loki's three children by Angraboda, Fenrir, Hel, and Jormungandr, and tossed Jormungandr into the great ocean. The serpent grew so large that it was able to surround the entire earth and grasp it in its own tail, as it's referred to as, well, the world serpent. And apparently, when it releases its tail, Ragnarok will begin. Yeah. Basically a destruction to the end of the world. Yeah, all this rich history is so heavy and gloomy, isn't it? Isn't there like a, the sun will shine like California for all to enjoy? Like, where's that written down? Nowhere, huh? Just cataclysms and monsters. Jormungandr's arch enemy is the thunder god, Thor. And apparently, a megalodon too. Cause let's face it, a giant serpent versus a four story great white, it would definitely be a good fight. I think if Thor showed up and started smashing up both, it would literally be the best Marvel Universe movie yet. Another encounter comes when Thor goes fishing with the giant Hymir. When Hymir refuses to provide Thor with bait, he strikes the head off Hymir's largest ox to use as his bait. Okay, easy, roid rage. Sheesh. They row to a point where Hymir fishes, he prepares his fishing line and a large hook and baits it with the ox head, which Jormungandr bites. Thor then yanks the serpent up from the water and the two throw hands. Okay, so it sounds like it isn't that big. I mean, it's huge, but the wrapping around the planet has got my dimensions off. Maybe it was like a metric versus imperial thing back then. I don't know, what do you think? Comment down below who would win because when it gets into mystical powers and stuff, it becomes a little unfairly matched, no? Number three, Cthulhu. Come on, we know this guy. Now this would be a good fight. This is sort of fathomable. Well, kinda. An extinct shark versus a made up ender of worlds. Cool, let's do that. Basically a giant humanoid octopus dragon versus the Carcharasless Megalodon, a triplex size apex predator. It's definitely gonna be in Vegas and pay-per-view. I'll tell you that for free. Cthulhu is a fictional cosmic horror entity thought up by the twisted mind of cosmic horror writer H.P. Lovecraft. First introduced in his short story called The Call of Cthulhu, published by the American pulp magazine Weird Tales in 1928, he's like the first creature Lovecraft pondered up. He's terrifying. He's supposed to bring Armageddon upon us when he wakes up from the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, again, not all sunshine and rainbows with these stories. Actually, like, ever with these stories. Cthulhu is a great old one, almost the god of all gods in these stories. All these characters intertwine and apparently he's our last call. Lovecraft depicts it as a gigantic entity worshipped by cultists in the shape of a green octopus, dragon, humanoid, bipedal creature. And it's like 10 stories high. Yeah, like massive. Like us looking at toy army men. The Lovecraft universe, aka the Cthulhu mythos, its appearance alone is enough to haunt your dreams. Lovecraft describes this guy as a face full of octopus-like feelers, a scaly, rubbery looking body, sharp claws on its hands and feet, and of course, dragon's wings. So it can fly and swim. In other words, the worst thing you can imagine. Yeah. Cthulhu can fly, which he has on the Meg, for sure. And also, the mind control, I don't know how Shark's brains works, but Cthulhu gets in there. Yeah, you're in trouble, Sharky. Number two, the Leviathan. Okay, so we're diving into some very sacred texts now. The Bible. In said pieces of scripture, there's a tale of a giant creature that could swallow up cities, apparently, and is also an awesome roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland. Gotta try it if you haven't been on it yet. This twisty, turny, vicious monster was actually modeled after this twisty, turny, vicious monster, the Leviathan, the second of the great monsters described in the book of Job. This Leviathan, Leviathan, is an absolute unit of a sea monster who's impervious to literally any human weapon. I mean, what were the weapons back then though? Like bows and arrows, swords maybe, little pokey things, you know? It's not gonna do much. Apparently locusts too, yeah, those are terrifying. This Leviathan breathes fire. It emits smoke from its nostrils and it's related to another ancient monster called Lotan, a seven-headed giant serpent who's represented as pure chaos. I mean, what Bible creature isn't terrifying though? Was this giant sea snake a water dragon? Cause apparently it's something like 300 miles long according to the Bible. So it's like Jormungandr territory, but longer. Maybe it's the same creature told by two different peoples? Oh, <gasps> mind blown. Again, the Megalodon I think would just chomp this thing and dive deep down to the twilight zone and it's lights out. We've seen Jaws, right? Yeah, picture that, but like 40 times the size. Yeah, we're gonna need a bigger boat. 
Number one, Godzilla. I had to, obviously, we're having fun here today. Godzilla, yes, of course, the King of Kings, AKA Kaiju, originates from a series of Japanese films. The character first appeared in the 1954 film Godzilla and became a worldwide pop culture icon ever since. Appearing in a ton of different media, 32 films, four American films, video games, novels, comic books, TV shows, you name it. Godzilla has been, like I said, the king of king of all monsters. Of course, a phrase first used in Godzilla, king of monsters. Godzilla is enormous. It's destructive. It's a prehistoric sea monster awakened and empowered by nuclear radiation. With the nuclear incidents of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the Lucky Dragon 5 incident, Godzilla doesn't really like nukes. Yeah. The amphibious reptilian monster is basically based around a concept of a dinosaur erect, standing up, very tall. Of course, a bony plated back and tail, and let's not forget the special abilities Godzilla has as well. Atomic heat beams, or as I like to call it, stank breath. Dude had tonsil stones so bad, nuclear energy generates from them. Well, not really, but inside of his body using electromagnetic force to concentrate it into a laser radioactive beam. Amphibious, of course, so it swims and breathes underwater, which is gonna come in handy. Immune to conventional weapons and can regenerate. Yeah. And it's massive. Of course, Godzilla was said to average around 150 feet tall. In the American version, Godzilla is like 400 feet tall. Like, just a little bit bigger. This is kind of a no-brainer here, obviously, right? This little sunfish would have nothing on the king. Number five, SCP-1128. Number five on our list, 1128, is a terrifying entity that manifests itself as a colossal aquatic predator. It's sometimes described as a being similar to a shark, only in a more grotesque and twisted appearance, with common descriptions across all sightings being a mouth full of teeth. The entity manifests itself as an aquatic predator to anyone who is given a full description of the beast's appearance, either through a written description or a spoken description, so... Sorry. Sorry for describing it. Few surviving subjects have described it as resembling a massive monstrous deformed shark. Once a subject is exposed to detailed knowledge of 1128, they become infected by its latent psychic ability, forming a connection. From here, no immediate abnormal changes in behavior or occurrences are present, with the only notable variance being a hesitation to enter bodies of water, for good reason, too. Once an exposed subject submerges themselves completely in water, they are caught by 1128. Any submerged water is enough. Subjects are taken mysteriously to an ocean, the location of which is redacted by the Foundation. From here, you are hunted by SCP-1128. The Foundation patrols this unmarked ocean in a desperate attempt to contain the creature and protect anyone unfortunate enough to be caught in its trap. It's difficult to interview subjects after an exposure, as any detailed description of the encounter does run the risk of contaminating more Foundation members. Should a member or subject become infected by SCP-1128, treatment is immediately advised, with Class C amnesiacs being used to try and block memory of the entity. So, maybe for your sake and my sake, try to forget number five entirely for your own safety. Now the foundation does advise that if you've been enjoying the content that we produce, you should toss a subscribe our way. Number four, SCP-1451. SCP-1451 is an odd one even by foundation standards. SCP-1451 presents itself as a set of 26 metal statues at the bottom of the ocean. All appear to be statues of children of varying heights. The statues are all standing in a circle, holding each other's hands and facing outwards in a ring formation. Should any object, living or otherwise, with a mass greater than 40 gram enter into the ring, SCP-1451 begins to animate. The statues will shift themselves in a counterclockwise movement. Their hands will raise and lower slightly, and bubbles can be seen protruding from their mouths. Once it becomes fully animated, SCP-1451 displays advanced strength and tactics, being reported to use various martial arts to dispatch targets, pressure point application on humans, and precise strikes on machinery. They move in perfect unison and coordination, with some speculation that they operate on some level of hive mind mentality across the 26 individuals individual entities. Once SCP-1451 has begun its hunt, it will not rest until it is disposed of whatever invaded its territory. The Foundation refers to three states of SCP-1451. Class 1 is the initial ring of statues in its inert state, Class 2 is the slight animation and bubbling seen present, and a Class 3 situation is when an active hunt has begun. To try and prevent a Class 3 situation, the SCP Foundation has installed a sphere of wire mesh netting to ensure nothing too large enters the ring. Natural water currents and oceanic movement aren't to be obstructed.
constructed. The creature does need to eat sometimes. Number three, SCP-835. SCP-835 manifests itself as a large cluster of polyps resembling a species of coral, although it's significantly larger than any discovered species of coral. The center mass of the cluster is a very large oval with three meter long polyps at each end. SCP-835 does not move, instead anchoring itself to the ocean floor using heaving tentacles that protrude from the polyps. The tentacles are coated in an adhesive substance and have been shown to be incredibly strong, capable of damaging bulkheads and steel. The coral base of SCP-835 is extremely durable and resistant to most attempts to collect any tissue samples, with the foundation having to use high-powered diamond drill bits to collect even small samples of DNA. SCP-835 emits a large mass of semi-liquid material several times a day from each polyp. The toxic substance appears to be a mixture of digested solids, fecal matters, several bacteria, viruses, and parasites, with many sequences having originated only from 835. So what exactly makes SCP-835 so threatening? Well, sample reports from SCP-835 have shown that it's comprised almost exclusively of human DNA. Its hard shell seems to be recycled tooth enamel, its tentacles matching human flesh. A level 4 clearance declassified document from the Foundation detailed an encounter with an underwater isolation team, in which an incident in which two members of the isolation team were swallowed by SCP-835, pulled in by its tentacles deep underneath what they had initially thought to be a cave, but realized was the contents of SCP-835's stomach. The crew members reported descending deeper and deeper, spending up to 72 hours inside the creature's digestive tract, the insides of its intestines lined with remnants of unfortunate victims, claiming that they had been morphed into flesh, and there was a wall of faces crying for release. Eventually, one of the crew members was released, though after significant breaches to its suit, Unfortunately, he had to be let go from the Foundation. We thank him for his service. Number 2. SCP-1092 SCP-1092 presents itself as a class of Astyachthys fish, and when the creature is matured, it resembles any number of other ocean-dwelling fish, with the only notable variance being its increased aggressive behavior, attacking prey. It's difficult for the Foundation to study, as only adult specimens can be studied, as in its juvenile phase, SCP-1092 are parasites birthed from a living host. Once SCP-1092 infects the blood stream of its host, absorbing nutrients directly from the host's blood. Once exposed, the parasites initially are but a few millimeters in most its size, but grow many times their size, with the largest extracted one on record being 2.1 centimeters. There is insufficient data on how SCP-1092 infects its hosts. The current research data theorizes that minuscule eggs makes its way into the body through small cuts and scrapes, which would explain the fish's violent tendencies. Those infected by SCP-1092 report fatigue, weight loss, and increased appetite and in many cases report a feeling of something fluttering or squirming inside the body. However, this is not present in all cases, as there are reported case files of hosts not experiencing any visible symptoms whatsoever until the parasite has unfortunately matured to its adult aquatic stage. Once the parasites have matured, the now adolescent creature will try to forcibly remove themselves from the physical body of their host, using their sharp teeth to cut through blood vessels and skin. Subjects at this stage will sustain injuries, severe blood loss, and in some cases worse. Thankfully, the SCP Foundation has effectively secured SCP-1092, keeping it housed in a completely watertight cell, where it is given the occasional domestic pig to act as a host for its reproductive cycle. Poor little piggy. Thank you, piggy. Thank you, Foundation. Number 1. SCP-3000 SCP-3000 is one of the most powerful SCPs currently being monitored by the Foundation. SCP-3000 is a Class 8 cognitohazardous entity and is a Level 5 classified document. I really shouldn't even be talking to you about this, but it's good to get this information out there. It is a massive, massive aquatic sea serpent that closely resembles a moray eel, only gigantic. There's been significant difficulty in efforts in trying to document its true size, but it is estimated to be anywhere between 600 and 900 kilometers in length, with its head measuring roughly 2.5 meters wide and its body as large as 10 meters in diameter. SCP-3000, thankfully, is typically a sedentary creature, not moving much at all, usually only responding to feeding. The majority of its body rarely moves. SCP-3000 has been known to be carnivorous, and when it hunts, it has been known to move exceedingly quickly. Fascinatingly, despite its gargantuan size, SCP-3000 does not appear to need sustenance to maintain its body's function, and thus its digestive process is unknown. Although complicating matters slightly is a process wherein SCP-3000 disperses a thin layer of viscous dark gray sludge through its skin whilst it consumes its prey. It doesn't stop there though. SCP-3000 has been recognized to cause severe mental damage in those who research it. Direct observation and study has been proven to cause mental alteration in Foundation researchers, experiencing paranoia, fear, 
anxiety, memory loss, and most worryingly, inexplicable severe headaches. It's unknown how SCP-3000 causes this, but the theories are that it has a latent psychic ability. There are some who believe SCP-3000 could be an old god that has found its way into our world. The creature is too immense to be contained in any Foundation facility, instead being kept in a clandestine area of the Bay of Bengal, in an area barred from the public, routinely patrolled and surrounded by Foundation vessels. Be extremely thankful that the brave members of the Foundation are researching and containing this. Secure, contain, protect. Those are the goals of the Foundation.